So Poetry Scores comes out of a hunger to put other words to music that are deeper than me and deeper than mine. And to this day, I'm so committed to taking words that are already written better than I could ever write and putting them to music. And I really encourage that creative model. The second thing is, you are not the center of the circus. You know, you're not the biggest act in the circus. I mean, some people are, really. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hey, rock stars, it's your host, Lid Shaw. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, the podcast bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Chris King, a songwriter, music and film producer, and award-winning author. He also happens to be the singer in my St. Louis band, or perhaps I should say bands, plural, because we have had so many bands under so many names. Enormous Richard, Eleanor Roosevelt, Three Fried Men. I've been making music with Chris since 1989, and we have written, recorded, and even forgotten a great deal of songs. My final year of college was when I started a band with Chris, and we continue to play somewhat regularly for the next five years or so when all the members finally decided to move away to different coasts, and the band finally broke up. Well, sort of. Chris and I loved the road so much and didn't want to give up the dream, so we did the next best thing to touring and playing our music wherever we went. We tossed a portable recording studio into the back of a car and drove around the country gathering music, stories, and poetry from everyone else wherever we went. This new passion launched a series of field recording road trips that ultimately captured witty raconteurs from North Carolina, a singing Bushman from Liberia, a poet laureate from Maine, a one-man band in Boston, and the originator of Memphis Jump Blues in Queens, New York, and many others. We took all these recordings and wove in our own contributions to create new records that brought music, poetry, and story together. From our African friend Yema Kuma, we found the name of our record label, Hu Bella Tu, which means beautiful people in Liberian. Years later, after living in New York City for a while, Chris moved back to St. Louis and formed an international all-volunteer arts collective called Poetry Scores. While I was getting deeper into my recording career in Nashville, Chris and Poetry Scores continued to take poems, write songs around them, and create silent films to accompany the records like long-form music videos. He has produced or co-produced musical adaptations of the poetry of Gertrude Stein, Pulitzer Laureate Paul Muldoon, Missouri Poet Laureate David Cluel, Australian Poet Laureate Les Murray, who wrote a poetic preamble to the Australian Constitution, and Connecticut Poet Laureate Leo Canellan. He directed two feature silent films for poetry scores, Blind Cat Black, which scores the Turkish poet Is Ihan, and Go South for Animal Index, which scores the Salt Lake City St. Louis poet Stephanie Russell. With me, and here at the Toy Box, He's co-produced No Dark in America by the legendary jump blues musician Roscoe Gordon, which was released on Dual Tone in 2002. And he served as executive producer on St. Louis raconteur Fred Friction's Murder Balladeer and on Just Piping by All-Ireland Piper Michael Cooney. And he produced Memory Music by Merchant Marine songster Pops Farrar, who is the father of Jay Farrar from Uncle Tupelo and Sunvolt. And he has done all this while, meanwhile, working daily as the managing editor of the St. Louis American, the largest weekly newspaper in Missouri. I am beyond excited to have my musical brother and oldest friend, Chris King, to Recording Studio Rockstars, Chris, a.k.a. Brother Dog. Are you ready to rock? Yes, I am, Pigeon (laughs) O'Digley. We got so much to talk about, dude. I feel like we need to catch people up on a massive history of stuff that we've done somehow in in this interview. Do you think we can do it? I'm up for it. I want to, as a journalist, as you credited me, want to just 
pause on a couple of things you said and uh, I guess maybe not correct, but amplify. Uh, Nyema Kuma was a Grebo man. Mm -hmm. uh, his language was not Liberian. It was Grebo. Oh, yeah. Good correction. Uh, Roscoe's record that we made, I had the co-write on the title track, uh, which uh, Roscoe called me one night and just couldn't find the lyric. And I gave him, I thought, some really bad lyrics and he kept some of them. So th there was that. Nice, man. Well, let's kind of take it way back for you and kind of get to know you a little bit better. I've done my long introduction, but I want to hear in your own words what it was like starting out in music for you. What did starting out smell like to you in music and recording? Well, it, in a way, it smelled like loneliness because the songs I first wrote with you and Richard Skubish and Marshall Boswell uh, in the band Enormous Richard, our campus band at Washington University in St. Louis that brought us all together, I wrote all those lyrics and melodies driving to see my girlfriend. I was a really lonely uh, transfer student at Wash U. I had been in the Navy and went AWOL and left my ROTC scholarship at Boston University. I transferred to this other campus and I just didn't know anybody. I felt a lot older. You know, I'd gone AWOL from the US Navy in a foreign port and all these other guys were like smoking pot for the first time. It was really strange for me. And so I'd leave town to go see my high school girlfriend who was at Illinois State University. And I didn't have a radio in my car. I'd bought a bare bones car because I had no money. And I really wrote our first record driving uh, on the road alone and lonely truly lonely. And so all those first melodies and lyrics, I just improvised to keep myself awake and to entertain myself. That's intense, man. Um, I remember, he, you know, hearing your stories of coming back from the Navy and, and coming to Wash U, and you definitely were like an older, you know, elder statesman to me at, back in college. Um, and it didn't take much. All you had to be was about a year older than me to, to be that, right? <laughs> a year was a lot then. It was, it was indeed. But I remember you had some pretty funny stories about kind of writing songs with Scoob, but some, something to do with climbing out on the roof too, right? Yeah, that's that's a prehistory. Uh, you, you mentioned all of our bands together, Enormous Richard, Eleanor Roosevelt, Three Fried Men, of which uh, I think Eleanor Roosevelt has the best trace on uh, media that people could stream or download. So you should look at, for the Eleanor Roosevelt records. But before Enormous Richard was Big Toe, and before Big Toe was Super Pig on Broadway, and that was Richard Scoobish, who we called Scoob. It was our uh, eighth grade uh, band, if you <laughs> if you want to call it a band. Our friend Darren Boyd, who uh, went on, who I, I hope hears this, and uh, we called him Bird. Bird went on to be a brilliant heavy metal guitar player with Randy Rhodes chops, and he can command a stage. Uh, on a, for a heavy metal cover band like anybody in the world. I uh, tr truly admire Darren Boyd. But as kids, he had an auto harp that me and Scoob borrowed. Eighth <laughs> grade, right. <clears throat> climbed out on the ledge of my, my mother's not, you know, soon to be Section 8 housing apartment in Pontoon Beach, which was the down market fringe of Granite City, which itself was a pretty tough uh, town. And we, on the window ledge, wrote these songs that we performed. We had a gig. You know, I always had more gigs than practices, you know. <laughs> you know. So we had a gig after one practice, uh, a, a, the best looking girl in town. And we did always favor uh, the fairer sex and always wanted to have audience members who were alert, smart, beautiful women. From the beginning, that was the case. Monica Fanning, her sister Lee Fanning, definitely two of the most smart, beautiful, wonderful people ever. We played her uh, Monica's 13th birthday party in her parents' basement. That was super big on Broadway. Nice, nice man. I like that. Um, you know, you talk about getting gigs. And I remember when we started our band, Enormous Richard, the, the saying was, Chris gets gigs. That's what we used to say. I don't know if you remember us saying that to your face yeah, or behind your yeah. back, but you were known as the guy who would get gigs, so therefore that kept our band going. I mean, without gigs, it's kind of hard to keep a band going sometimes. Yeah, I mean, guys who get gigs uh, have bands. I was not uh, a good singer and was one of the worst singers of all the bands that had an audience in St. Louis, but I could get gigs, and if the band is fun and high energy, uh, the singer can grow into it, and you'll over overlook a lot of flaws on the performance side if it feels good to be in the room. And honestly, uh, Richard Byrne, a playwright, a very distinguished playwright now, and a good friend of ours and a very early supporter of our music, uh, who I'll make sure hears this because uh, I love Richard, uh, he always was adamant that our, we were successful because we 
attractive women came to see us and then men followed them and we created this good feeling. The band members weren't bad looking. Richard was really handsome, looked like a Tom Cruise. You were very, very handsome then, had long hair and just had this, you look like a rich kid who was cool, <laughs> which is like the coolest thing to be. Matt Fuller had a nice look. Um, I was, someone uh, said I looked like Gary Busey if, before Gary Busey got burnt out, uh, which is probably about, I was a Navy guy who, you know, I was I, jumping around on stage. So then the guys followed the the beautiful women and it was fun. So people did not go home alone and it became a scene where you could go and get drunk and make a new friend to spend the night with. And that was really part of our appeal uh, more, I think, than the music. Well, I mean, as I recall, one of our earliest gigs was Rock for Reproductive Rights. Wasn't that sort of our launching gig for Enormous Richard too? Yeah, that was the Enormous Richard debut was Rock for Reproductive Rights. It's important to note, although we were a good time band and became known as a goof band because we had funny songs, we were activists from the beginning. And I, I don't want to personally uh, combine the uh, frisky atmosphere of our gigs with uh, rock for reproductive rights because, I, you know, abortion, <laughs> abortion's not birth right, control. Right, right, right. Good point. But, good point. But we were activists, and uh, our first gig was an activist gig. In fact, you talked about my capacity to get gigs. I started getting gigs, not for the band, but uh, we had a activist group in St. Louis called Single Point of Light. Uh, George H.W. Bush, Bush President 41, had said that um, what America needed was a thousand points of light, sort of a thousand volunteers. We someone, someone ironically said, well, we'll be a single point of light. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll cover one of the a thousand. And we did progressive benefits, home, raise money for homeless shelter, raise money for uh, reproductive rights, raise money for a Chinese student group after the Tiananmen Square massacre. So that became Enormous Richard because I learned that uh, with my colleagues, Ted Iber, uh, Teresa Everline, Sean Hilditch, Bob Putnam, is a really interesting group of St. Louis activists and organizers who all went, in to do, went on to do magnificent things on their own. Sean Hilditch works for the city of London now and has for uh, more than a decade. Bob Putnam runs the Way Out Club in St. Louis. Anyway, we started Single Point of Light, and we were drawing 350 people. And I thought, I want to be in a band that plays for all these people. And that was Enormous Richard's first gig. Yeah. Well, I remember you calling me up. Um, I don't remember if it was for that gig or if that was the, that was the one that we were rehearsing for initially. I think it was. But you asked me if I'd come play in the band, and I sort of at that point, for some reason or other, I, my mom had I gathered up her fiddle, which she just had around the house to paint um, as you know, a piece of still life. And I brought that back, and I think I had a harmonica, and I sort of insisted that I would come do it, but only if you would let me play harmonica and fiddle in the band. Well, Lidge, I'd like to give your uh, your regular audience a glimpse of you as a young musician. I mean, you were totally a catch on the band scene. I mean, you are one of these people who you, your gift of melody is out of sight. You have great rhythm on anything you play. You can learn any instrument you pick up and you're fun to play music with. You're forgiving of mistakes for the most part. You're spontaneous. You don't take, you never take yourself or anyone else too seriously. So as someone who wanted to be in a band and was meeting all of these talented people after being lonely as hell as a Navy dropout and AWOL, uh, you know, refugee, I thought I want to be in a band with this guy, but you were in Dr. Seuss playing. <laughs> right playing with David Melson, who went on to be part of everything we do. But, you know, that was flashy chord changes, complicated rhythms, and I couldn't ever uh, be a part of that. And so I kind of wooed you, and I basically said, once you said your, your mother had given you these folk instruments, I said, you can just learn on stage. You don't even have to come to rehearsals. Uh, and, and, we'll, and we did actually kind of rehearse live for the most part. Yeah, but rehearsals so, were pretty fun. Remember, we used to, um, I think we started out at Joe's apartment for the first one, but then we almost immediately moved it over to the new business school uh, that they had just built at Washington University. And we just sort of uh, took over uninvited the, the enormous lecture hall and would rehearse from the stage there with all the fancy lighting and all that. Yeah, we broke into campus spaces to rehearse, which I can't recommend to the, <laughs> to the public. But we also did rehearse on the street. We busked 
And I can recommend that because if you stand out there for two hours and play the same songs over and over, uh, as long as you repeat them, uh, not immediately, you know, you play them all through once and then play them all through again, you can draw crowds on and off and make 15, 50 bucks and that's beer money. It's a great way to really learn and practice the art of trying to get people's attention and, and tell a story and just engage people because you're constantly trying to get an audience. Yeah, I learned some of my, uh, if you want to say my stage moves, busking, because you could move out and interact with people that were on the fringes on the sidewalk and you could draw them in. And as a front man, one of my signatures was always to make sure I had a long mic cord and get off the stage and, and walk around the tables, sit down at the tables with people, sit on people's knees, take hats off people's heads, take people's beers and walk away with them and do crazy stuff like that. And this is all on a cabled microphone, by the way. Well, for the uh, busking, it, you know, there was no microphone, but for gigs and clubs, you know, this is walking out off the stage into the audience with a long, hopefully long microphone cable. Yeah. Well, so, uh, brother, I like to uh, ask our guests to start us with an inspirational quote. Have you got anything you'd like to launch off the podcast with? Get us excited about making records? I really do. It's, it, I don't have very many uh, original thoughts, I don't think. But one of them is this. To be overcommitted is to be uncommitted. If you always say yes, just always say no. Oh, man. Dude, you're, you're really like hitting a pain point right now for me. I feel that, I feel that big time these days. Look, look, everyone thinks no is a good answer. They prefer yes. What people don't like is no answer. They don't like maybe, and they don't like yes when it's no. Say no if it's no. If yeah. it's maybe, say no. Say yes when, only when it's yes. Um, do you f remember that sort of applying to our early music making? Or did we just say yes to everything? I worried about that much later. You know, I, I married a person wiser than myself, which I recommend. And she really pointed that out to me as one of my flaws. She says, Chris, you say yes to everybody. If you say yes to everybody, just say no to everybody. Carly M. King, my, my spouse. And I thought, you know, you're right. I put it in my own words to be overcommitted, to be uncommitted. But the other thing is, you know, it's very simple. If you're going to say yes, say everybody, say no to everybody, because that's what you mean. Right. That's a good point. All right. I'm going to remember that myself. Um, rock stars, don't say yes to everything. Pick what you want to do. All right. So now, um, Chris, you know, you talked about sort of leaving the Navy, which I'm sure was a real down point for you. But let's talk about another sort of important failure along the way. I mean, we've had a lot of changes. You know, we've had some heights in music with a band. We've we've been in, you know, the the classic story of the band of of friends and brothers from school and college years that breaks up, and then you're like, where am I going to find music again? Have you got any uh, stories you'd like to share about important failures? Yeah, one I wince about a lot is, uh, you mentioned Paul Muldoon as one of the poets we did a project with. He won uh, a Pulitzer Prize in literature, is perennially uh, rumored to be a Nobel laureate contender, and I think he will be a, a Nobel laureate within a few years. Uh, Northern Ireland uh, Irish poet, he's at Princeton University now. We have a mutual, couple of mutual friends. He was incredibly gracious in the early phases. Uh, we went out to dinner together. He signed a baseball for me. I like to have uh, poets sign baseballs. He signed, I'm looking at it now in my uh, museum office. Uh, I scuffed a bunch of baseballs with African mud when I went home to Africa with my wife, and he signed one of those. And we were kind of like buddies, honestly. He was in my uh, confidence and vice versa. I uh, can be a, a smart ass, and uh, I use email and social media as much as anybody, overuse it sometimes. And I think people are my friends when they're not yet. And I think people think I'm funny when they haven't ever given me any reason to think that uh, for me to think that uh, they think I'm funny. So I did this bantering email thing about a guest uh, lecturer we had. And this is right when Poetry Scores was getting real academic legitimacy. I'd been a visiting artists at the University of Hawaii. This is the University of Missouri, St. Louis. It's on their speaker series to support our pr project with Muldoon. And by smarting off about this, uh, a friend of, turns out to be a close friend of Muldoon's, uh, he dropped us and you know, he wrote a really curt, cold email to me and I think I had it coming. So that taught me not everybody's my friend. 
Uh, I'm not as funny as I think I am. And it's good to be a little more professional, even if you're an outsider like me, because not everybody's your friend. Well, I like to think that people get my jokes on this podcast, but I realize that uh, not always, not always. Well, now, how about uh, a, a sort of an aha moment for you? Was there anything where, you know, you kind of it saw, sort of all clicked for you musically? I mean, I, I imagine that Poetry Scores was one of those for you. For me, it's, it's almost nothing but aha moments because I had so little musical uh, gift to start with. I'm not being falsely mum, humble or modest. I, I had words. Um, I wanted to sing. I had melodies, but I couldn't sing. And I couldn't even co communicate the melodies. My singing was so poor. Uh, and, and I just stuck with it. And that's an aha right there that if you get people that enjoy playing music with you and you do it for fun, you actually will get better at it. You don't actually have to be good at it when you get started. And mm -hmm. the band that really started rock, I mean, Chuck Berry started rock and roll, but the band that um, internationalized rock and roll and made it a phenomenon was the Beatles, I think we could agree. And they were not a particularly good band when they started. Then they were very young. They were you know, mid-teen agers, 13, 14, 15. But they, they were not a good band when they started. Uh, Enormous Richard was not a good band. I was certainly not a good singer when I started. But now, you know, I had a, last time Poetry Scores had a gig that I sang in, and I mostly produce and don't, don't perform now. But my daughter brought some friends. My daughter's 13. And her friend said, your daddy's a good singer. And this, <laughs> nice. you know, these, are, these, are, these are very tough it, children who themselves sing well. Yeah. So you, if you keep doing it, you get better. And the reason to keep doing it is because it's fun to do with other people. Well, I specifically remember, you know, we started Enormous Richard and, you know, you were self-admittedly not the best singer. You, your strength was lyrics and getting gigs and just being a great band leader. And um, then I went away and did my backpacking travels around the world. Meanwhile, you guys skip kept... something, man. You went away to play blues in the Hong Kong with your brother Nathan. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've mentioned that on the show. Yeah, I went to Hong Kong to go play in a blues band with my brother Nate for a half a year, and that's a whole story in and of itself. But uh, well, I will share this one bit. You know, we had our first recording, which was Enormous Richard's Almanac. And I had been sort of without any of my own music during most of my travels until I arrived in Hong Kong. I'd already spent months traveling in Europe and everything. And I got to Hong Kong and there in Nate's room was his copy of Enormous Richard's Almanac, our record that we had done just the year before or the summer before, I guess. And I remember specifically borrowing that from Nate, popping it into my, you know, portable yellow tape playing Walkman, Sony Walkman, and taking it up to the roof of an um, apartment building I was living in in Hong Kong and just sitting there and listening to our record and just having this utter moment of elation, just singing along at the top of my lungs with a pair of headphones on to all of China for them to hear. You know, It was that moment when you get away from your own record and then come back to it and it all sort of clicks with you and you just absolutely love it. Hopefully we all get to experience something like that. I want to tell your regular listeners uh, a couple things about your family pursuant to that story, which I don't know that I've heard that or I don't remember it. It's a beautiful story. But um, Elijah or Lidge is a member of a family that is sort of epic in nurturing the arts and particularly the endeavors of the members of the family. They, they the, the Shaw and Foote family set sort of international standards for families that uh, respect themselves as families. So this is his brother, Nate, I call him, like to call him Nathan, which is what his mother called him. He's a jazz uh, piano player and a, a, leads a music school in Brooklyn. He supported everything we've done, played on everything we've done, uh, incredible enthusiast of everything we've ever done. Uh, his uh, religious, their, their father, uh, Bursley, Alan Shaw, the late uh, Bursley, Alan Shaw, everyone called him Alan, we called him Bursley. He... <laughs> preached a sermon. He was a banker who gave up on finance uh, and adopted uh, the, the, the pastorage, being a pastor of the Unitarian Church. And he, and this is in the uh, metropolitan Boston area around the uh, uh, Concord, the cradle of the revolution. He did a sermon on uh, a song on this cassette that Lidge was singing on the rooftop in Hong Kong, uh, Dogs with Their Heads Out the Window. 
which I wrote with Richard Scoobish, a.k.a. Scoob. Mm -hmm. That's Alan Shaw. And I'm saving Emily Shaw's the the sister who just adores her brothers and supports everything we've all done and always wants us to stay with her wherever she lives. But I'll conclude with Julia Foote, the late Julia Foote, my great friend and mentor uh, and Lidge's mother and mentor. And she nurtured us uh, to epic degrees every time we ever toured. The Nyemakuma project, which started Hubella 2, which became Poetry Scores, was completely Julia's effort. She yeah. more or less made me come stay with her in Cambridge and uh, – was it Acton then? Uh, and anyway, yeah, she was yeah. made that whole project happen. Yeah, so, um, man, I appreciate that. Chris, I've been writing everybody else's intros for the past year. It's really nice to hear you writing mine, so thank you for that, and I'm going to borrow it later. And we should come back to that. I just, in concluding what I was, the point I was going to make was that I remember coming back from being overseas and rejoining the band and just being in this utter moment of thrill. Like you guys let me come back into the band after I've been gone for a year. And it was so much fun. And I was hanging out with Scoob, Richard Scoobish, um, our, another member of the band. He played acoustic guitar and he was, he was the really good, he was our Superman, you know, he was the Clark Kent up on stage there. Um, playing and singing beautifully. But he told me, he was like, yeah, man, you wouldn't believe it. We've been playing all these gigs and Chris has gotten good. Chris can sing now. You know, so it was you talking about improving just from doing it reminded me of that story that Scoob shared. And that was only after a year of the band. But I mean, in that year was when you guys did that really intensive phase of touring and you were going up to Chicago and you and you sort of had a residency gig up there at the Elbow Room and um, I imagine other places as well. Um, but do you want to talk a little bit about that? Do you want to tell us a little bit about that, just that that era that I was gone? Share, yeah. share a good story. What, what defined Enormous Richard was good luck and uh, up to a point, but you wouldn't really take anything over good luck. You just can't beat good luck. So the first gig we ever did was Rock for Reproductive Rights, discussed earlier. Friend of ours, friend of mine from grad school, Renee Spencer, now Renee Saller, who's a great music writer, writes about classical music for the St. Louis Symphony. She's at the top of her game today. Uh, Renee brought uh, Steve Pick, who was the daily newspaper's pop music critic, and he liked us. Yeah. We were all over the map musically. But Steve was very forgiving of, of bad vocalists. If the intention was good and the performance was bad, it was good. So on the first gig, this really unrehearsed band was on the front uh, was the new, in the newspaper, That's the, right. the daily newspaper, and it was just like that for us. I sent a tape to a Cabaret Metro in Chicago. That's the best venue in the entire Midwest, without question. And they write us back a, a letter that says we like it. Call me and you've got a gig. So our first out-of-town gig is at the best venue in the nice. Midwest. Nicely done. And it, it just went like that for a long time. And so what you know, what you learn is if you do it every night, uh, we do like two-week tours all the time. And we play like you know, 12, 12 gigs in, in 14 days. And you come back and you're just – you're on top of it. You're in, you're, you can master your craft in a pretty short period of time yeah. as a musician. And I remember when we did that, I, I don't remember what the year was exactly. It was mid-90s and we did, or early, and we did our summer tour for two weeks, took us to Concord. I think that was the tour where you got to see um, Nyema and really meet him for the first time. Mm -hmm. And we came back to St. Louis and uh, then went and recorded with Megan, who was just on the show recently. Megan Gohill. Yep, to do Walker um, with his head down at Webster University. And so we went into the studio on the heels of a tour when we were just like hot shit. You know, we knew the songs. We really knew how to play all these things. And for me, you know, I was playing a lot of banjo at the time, and it's just really helped. I mean, you know, it's pretty easy to suck on banjo. And, and so getting those two weeks and really got my chops together. So Rockstars, I highly recommend any chance you get. If you can ever book a tour just before you hit the studio, it's one of the best things you can do for a recording session. Also, touring, you're pressed to uh, play more up-tempo music. I think we all in the studio, uh, many of us, tend to the mid-tempo and the ballads as our more serious material that we want to, to push on the world. But when you come off tour, you're used to playing like seven fast songs for every three songs, and that's probably ultimately the right ratio. Yeah, all right. So now we got lots of ground to cover here. So 
Let me ask you about the origin of Skuntry. Would you like to explain to people what Skuntry is? We had thought, Enormous Richard thought it had something a little different. This was when people were trying to name something that was happening. Uh, some called it twang. Some called it insurgent country. That's what Bloodshot Records called it. We were on their second compilation. Some called it alternative country, which I was never crazy about. Country punk. And we could be classified, Enormous Richard could be classified as all those things. But we called ourselves something else. We called it scuntry. I think what would be a more legitimate uh, name or, or, or der derivation would be skunky country because it was country that was a little bit skunked, you know, yeah. it was a little bit hard to take or you had to get used to it. But at the time, we actually thought it was ska. And that's really doesn't, <laughs> the evidence doesn't bear that out, Lidge. I think we had, we had one song with one break in it that went a little bit reggae for a moment. And that's probably it, all we needed. And that was composed by Marshall Boswell, founding member, graduate student in English at Washington University, currently a professor of English at uh, Rhodes College in his hometown of Memphis, very impressive person, a world uh, expert on David Foster Wallace, the modern novelist, contemporary novelist, and a deep guy, a John Updike scholar as well, has written books about John Updike. But uh, Marshall really wanted us to be something other than what we were. He wanted us to sound better. He wanted us to be more dynamic. He wanted me to sing less, and he wanted it to be more rhythmic. So it, he was pushed the ska element, and he did write ska stuff for the band. But Marshall went away to write novels and books about Updike and David Foster Wallace. <laughs> he, we, the term survived him, but it became more about the skunk than about the ska. All right. So um, it, it became about the skunk and the skunk became our mascot. And so rock stars, we, we, you may find some skunks on some of my t-shirt designs and things. And that is a pretty literal quote from our own band. Um, but now fast forward a little bit. And Chris, tell us where you are, because you've created something. I mean, we got lots to cover here, but I just want people to know where you're sitting right now, because you've created an environment in your home that is such a smart thing to do. It's, it's a live in the dream thing, and I encourage everyone to do it, to find a space to do it. In, in the more uh, common parlance, uh, if you didn't buy my bullshit pardon my French, you would say it's my man cave. And I'll, I'll cop to that. If you want to say it's a man cave, I'm a man and it's it's kind of a cave. But I'm in my basement, uh, which I call uh, the Scuntry Museum. My wife doesn't agree that the entire basement is the Scuntry Museum, but this is my <laughs> version of the events. I'm in the really the office of the museum. And uh, it's under the, the uh, garage. The garage is not heated. The basement's not heated. It's pretty chilly down here tonight in uh, December in St. Louis, Missouri, but I've created a, a kind of a museum of my hobbies. It's, it's, it's a curated space. We're a collecting uh, institution. I, I take stuff from people all the time. It's sort of the stuff that matters to me. Everything Lidge and I are talking about that we've done together is all over. Uh, Lidge's mother's art, she was a gifted uh, visual artist, uh, is here. I collect things about baseball, first ladies of the United States. I like pinup girls. I like the female form in general, rock and roll, poetry, and mixtures of all of that. Also my activism. Mm -hmm. And I collect cassettes, which is an underrated uh, medium I'd like to talk about if we get back to cassettes. I uh, collect other de I collect dead media of all kinds. And uh, really, an it's an archive of everything that we've ever done creatively and, uh, and a lot of visual art as well. Uh, some serious visual art in some cases. Yeah. Well, it's cool. I mean, it's just you walk around and you're probably used to it at this point. But for me, every time I visit, I'm just sort of lost in awe at all the little trinkets and details all over the walls. Um, and I think it's a smart thing to do because, you know, we've done a lot of stuff that was interesting to us, you know, over many years. And it's easy sometimes to to not necessarily think that it would be interesting to anybody else but yourself. And so with that thinking, sometimes you might just kind of forget to memorialize it, you know, and what you did is you just said at one point, I, this, all this stuff matters to me. I'm just going to create my own environment, my own museum full of everything I've ever worked on. So maybe I'll get you to uh, do a little video walkthrough with me at some point and we'll share that with everybody. Uh, but Rockstars, I just wanted you to know that's where Chris is coming from right now. That's where 
if I go to St. Louis, I'm going to be sitting and writing songs all night and, and drinking hopefully the best beer I've ever tasted, which usually happens when I'm hanging out with you, brother. Hey, um, rock stars, you can come visit St. Louis and uh, you get a free tour of this country museum and uh, a free beer if and you it, drink beer. And it's an interesting place you live. I mean, I think I remember you saying that, you know, neighbors had been part of the touring road crew for the Grateful Dead for many years, you know, just right next door and stuff like that. So you find really interesting people in unexpected places like that. Because you're you're in the outskirts of St. Louis. You're not right in the, the heart of St. Louis, right? I used to be the country. Now it's the suburbs. Uh, the exurbs are around the corner. But yeah, on one side of the house, the um, the owner was the road manager of the Grateful Dead, who's from Belleville, Illinois, right across the river, which is where Uncle Tupelo uh, Jeff Tweedy and Jay Farrar are from. Yeah. And on the other side of us, uh, uh, the house was owned by B- Geezer Butler, the basis of Black Sabbath. <laughs> nice, man. That's Yeah. Cool. And two houses around the lake uh, was a guy who was a banjo player on a river uh, a riverboat. And so was his father. So he's a second generation riverboat banjo player. What what the, the key thing is that we we're uh, built around a, a big farm pond that was landscaped to look like two, so they could call it lakes rather than lake when it's really pond. But the indentures, which was co-written by Geezer Butler of Black Sabbath and the road manager John McIntyre of the Grateful Dead, you can't fence your land if it abuts the common ground around the pond or the lakes. And what that means is that the bunkered mentality, the walled, uh, you know, the the gated community people would never buy here. So only weird, open, free people who can't fence their property would live here. And that's I'm one of them. And so was Geezer Butler. And so was the Dead's uh, road manager. That's cool, man. That's smart, smart move. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll see more of that in my neighborhood. Well, so now, Chris, let's let's. Um you know, there's there's a number of records that we got to do over the years, and we'll come back to speak specifically about more of those. But let's keep sort of um, painting the outline of of your musical journey and ours. Um, as the band sort of reached a point, everybody in the band, and again, I think this is like a classic scenario that people might experience. At some point, the band just kind of dissolved, you know, like the guy's moved off to different coasts. Everybody wanted to go pursue their their non-musical careers. And I remember feeling at that time really bummed out about it. I remember um, sort of having a band meeting, a huddle with you guys and saying, you know, I'm ready to do this for good. Who else wants to do it? And everybody just said, uh, I'm going to go do this. I, I'm going to go do that instead. But that that kind of became the end of the regular gigging, touring part of the band. You know, we continued to make music after that, but that was the end of the first chapter. And I remember there was sort of like a a gig that we played in Chicago. And right at the moment where I probably was supposed to return to St. Louis, you asked me if I would hop in the car and go west instead to go to Wyoming. Mm. You want to tell that story? Yeah, that's really something. So I... I've earned a living as a journalist all of my adult life, starting with a music journalist. And my first uh, piece of music journalism was about opening for Uncle Tupelo, the man that became Wilco and Sunvolt. And that was uh, getting paid to write about that experience blew my mind. And I pursued journalism ever since the thought that you could write about something uh, and it would be published locally and you'd be paid for it. It's pretty intoxicating. I've always done it. I did a feature for the the weekly newspaper I was writing about that I wrote about the Uncle Tupelo gig in, and it was about a man, a homeless man with a dog mm. who had taken rabbit hunting on New Year's Day, and the dog had stepped on a down power line and had burnt off his the, the back of his body, um, his two hind legs, and uh, how the dog lived was a marvel to all of us that got to know the dog named, named Bob. Mm-hmm. And James Bodie was the owner of the dog. Uh, he wouldn't say owner, uh, the companion of the dog. And the dog was saved by an animal hospital at the University of Illinois. Um, James was never happy with their treatment, although they saved his dog's life. James was a kind of person that found fault in everything and was a troublemaker and a very unstable person. But I got drawn into his orbit as a journalist trying to advocate for him and, of course, the dog, Bob. And James picked up and left. He was a transient. He didn't stay anywhere very long. And he went out to Cheyenne, Wyoming, 
uh, on the on the outskirts of it. It was either a, a junkyard with animals or a farm with junk, mm-hmm. and they had they had fighting roosters. Uh, and I know not everyone would like that, but they did have fighting roosters. They had mules. They had all kinds of dogs. They had greyhounds, uh, and they had junk, uh, all kinds of uh, half torn open everything. You know, trucks and um, you know refrigerators. It was, it was a junkyard. It was a junkyard. So uh, I went out there to work. I was working on a book, which I did finally finish, but have never published. And Lidge went with me. And as he said at the time, I was explaining, you know, I was always a wordy, verbal, literary guy. So I'm carrying on to him about what I'm working on. And he got it right away. And I was talking about uh, Travels with Charlie, where John, oh, yeah. uh, John Steinbeck book. picked up with his dog. Charlie mm-hmm. to, to, to grow across the country because Charlie would like get out of the car and, and go sniff after something and would start conversations, which the writer would benefit from. So, uh, Lidge said, I know you want me to be your dog. <laughs> I forgot about that. An unconscious quote of Vicky pop. I want to be your dog. Yeah. Well, you know, we sort of considered the dog our the other mascot for our band. Anyway, it was the dog and the skunk that we, we, I think we associated uh, with the dog more as in far as attitude goes. We may have smelled like the skunk more on the road, but we... Yeah, Eleanor Roosevelt has a record, Walker with his head down. Mm-hmm. And that, very interesting to me, that is a translation of an Inuit shamanic term for dog. And it's very good to know that the Inuit had a common language and a shamanic language, which only the sh- you know shamans, the, you know, the, the priests learn. And the way the priests describe the dog translates as Walker with his head down. That's right. Well, so, all right. So we went out to Wyoming and we started hanging out with um, Al and, and, and Jim. Al Bo- Robbins on the, the junkyard farm. Yeah. And th- in fact, that's where my Skype uh, image it comes from. It's that Polaroid that you took of me playing banjo sitting on a stump in the middle of a junkyard many, the storm many years in. ago. Um, but that was sort of the beginning of our traveling and capturing stories and, and music from people. Um, I remember writing a bunch of songs together. There was a um, in in one of the towns we were in. There was a, a an antique steam engine train that was sort of a museum, and you could go climb around it and sit in it. And uh, I was sitting in the the uh, engine compartment of this train with my banjo, writing songs with you. And we wrote a song that was called Ack Valve because that was one of the <laughs> names on the valve in this train. So um, we're getting into the weeds here, but. That sort of launched the next chapter for us musically, where we weren't really in a band touring, but we were still deciding to get in the car together, and we would drive around recording people. Because I was down in at MTSU, Middle Tennessee State University, and um, had kind of finished there now and was living in Nashville, and I had started to collect a little bit of recording gear. I got a DAT machine, a DAT, digital audio tape machine that used these little cassette tapes, but, you know, not for analog, for digital, and a a pair of mics and a good mic preamp. And that's kind of all we had initially. And, you know, we would throw that into a rack, throw it in the back of your car, and just hit the road for two weeks. And one of the things I really remember about that time of my life, too, was looking at my bank account and going, oh, I've got, I've only got $200 in my bank. Sure, I'll hit the road with you for two weeks and just travel with no plan at all. One thing I want to really say um, for your 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 listeners about what you just said is that we at a point got tired of going around the country and asking people to pay attention to us. If you want to know why I got tired of playing live, I got tired of going around the country and asking people to pay attention to me. I also got tired of singing the same songs over and over when I had written the words, because I think I'm a decent lyricist. I'm not one of the best. I'm not going to win awards for it. I think I'm good at it, good enough to, to keep a band going. But you can get to the bottom of my lyrics, and I can tell you for a fact, because I got to the bottom of almost every lyric. Very few things have I ever written has any leftover mystery to me. A song, Creepy Part of Town, which is on one of our records, it's one of the only songs that I can still sing and hear something new in the lines. The rest of it, I'm to the bottom of them, and they're um, they're not that deep, okay? So Poetry Scores comes out of a hunger to put other words to music that are deeper than me and deeper than mine. And to this day, I'm so committed to taking words that are already written better than I could ever write and putting them to music. And I really encourage that creative model. The second thing is, you are not the center of the, you're not the center of the circus. You know, you're not the biggest act in the circus. I mean, some people are. 
really. You know, Leonard Cohen was, okay, Jimi Hendrix was. Uh, I'm not. And after a point, I got tired of acting like I was the biggest show in town when I wasn't. So Who Bella 2 was going around the country and paying attention to other people. And we all immediately were energized by that. And it gave us another five years on the road, really. We spent five years on the road having people pay attention to us and really five years on the road paying attention to other people. And that second phase to me was much richer. Well, it was a lot of fun. And I'd like you to recount the story of going out there the first time. You had gone out and my mom had invited you to come stay at her place so that I think it was just so you could go and really interview Nyema the first time, right? Yes. All right. So maybe give us an introduction of who Nyema is and then tell the story of us, of you and I going back out there and deciding to record him. So Nyema Kuma would say he was from a Stone Age culture, and that's literally true. His, he was Bush Grabo, the people in the interior who were there before the creation of Liberia. Liberia was created by James Madison's uh, U.S. government, and it was a, 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 an attempt to repatriate former slaves to West Africa. And they behaved as badly as other colonial overlords. The fact of their having been former slaves and being black didn't really matter. It was a colonial model they were pushed into and they, they played the part. Bush Grable were exploited by them and they were exploited by the white missionaries. So Jema, when he came to the United States, he'd been exploited by black Americans repatriated to Liberia and by white missionaries that were there to quote unquote save their souls. So he had these multiple perspectives and he was he became his own anthropologist, his own folklorist. And he was at the Museum of Natural History as a staff performer when the great Margaret Mead was there and he did learn from Margaret Mead. So when Lidge and I met Nyema, he had he was a person with a Stone Age culture with Margaret Mead's perspective, all in one person. Mm -hmm. A total package of folklore an amazing human being. I went out and did some oral history on cassettes. I still have them here. They're actually, I could touch them with my hand here in the Skunter Museum. Lidge got, I'm going to say it, jealous that I went and got to hang out with Nyema and hang out with his mom. And so he insisted he go back with me and record him properly on better, uh, you know, with better machinery and with his great ear for recording. And that, we did release it, a uh, cassette. We probably released maybe 10 or 20 percent of everything we recorded, and that's something we talk about uh, publishing his archive in some form. Yeah. Well, you know, that's one of the things that kind of keeps us in business is, is uh, not finishing the things we start. <laughs> this, well, there's always more to do. There's always something to come back to. Oh, man, we got to really release that record we started way back when. Well, so, um, yes, I hopped in a car with you and we went back and I don't remember how long we were there, another a week or two weeks again. And this time around, we went and we met with Nyema and his brother or his brother-in-law was in Roxbury, Massachusetts. His brother, David Hoffman. Yeah, David. So tell the story about the church, because the place where we actually got to camp out for you know many days was just, it was surreal. Yeah, this was weird upon weird. So we're, we're with this African Bushman, this man from the bush, and yet he's got the Margaret Mead perspective. He does his own intro and his own analysis. I mean, you had to see Nyema to believe him. And mind you, it wasn't just words. He also played drums and sang. And he also, he danced. He absolutely yeah. did dance. He also costumed himself. He wore what he called his African diaper. This, <laughs> this, this long winding thing that he wrapped around his groin. And by the way, he was a fit, perfect physical specimen. Yeah, He had danced for Ola Tunji. He had, he had been on the for stage. Baba, Baba Tunji Ola Tunji in the, in, in the World's Fair in New York in 1965. It was a chiseled physique. On top of all that, we are in a 150-year-old brick, one-room, black church in Roxbury, Massachusetts. It was a tough, tough town, uh, very tough. We slept there, and Nima had this kind of sixth sense that I think comes from being in the bush, living in the wild, where you're not the top of the food chain, right? I mean, if you're living in the bush in Africa, there are things bigger than you that can eat you. And you have to know when they're coming. Nima had that sense. So, like, we'd be sitting there, and also he'd bolt up. We were all sleeping on the pews of the church. He'd bolt up, and he wouldn't say a word. He wouldn't disturb us, but he would go and, and unlock the door and relock the door and look around. And uh, it was amazing. <laughs> I'd so forgotten that. Also, about he, he told us something that most rock musicians won't accept, which was we took him out for a meal 
during our first session, we went to a pizzeria and he's very polite. So he's not going to say anything, but he just pushes the food around on his plate and never eats a bite of it. He tears the cheese off and, but he doesn't eat it. (laughs) And we say, what's wrong? He's like, man, pizza is not food. (laughs) (laughs) We'll have to circle back to how Nyema taught us to cook. Uh, He actually taught me how to cook rice for the first time in my life back then. And to this day, I still make um, turkey wing soup based on his recipe. Me too. But um, Nyema, also to to clarify, Nyema, this chiseled physique, this this powerful, energetic guy who's just like his piercing eyes. He could just look right through you as he tells a story. Um, he was at least 70 when we were recording him, I think, in he the was church. A very old man, and you could see it in his face, uh, but not not in his body, not in his mind, not in his soul. Yeah, so we set up in this church, and what I did is I had met, uh, shoot, I am forgetting the name of my friend, uh, I'll have to find that and add it later, but it was a guy who I had met down here who I knew was in Boston, he was a great indie rock producer, and he had a really cool band up there, but I, I got in touch with him, and I asked- Was it Jim Rondinelli? No, no, it wasn't Jim, no, it was another guy that I only knew briefly, um, but he- he had a great collection of microphones. And so I got in touch with him and I asked him if, um, or maybe he just offered to loan me. Is that your Sennheisers? He, what he did, yeah, he he had these Bayer Dynamic uh, ribbon mics. That I think it was the M201s. And he loaned us, you know, one for up close and some for the, I, I used my Earthworks mics for the room mics in the back of the church. And I kind of set up, you know, a handful of mics in a configuration, all of which we went through a little mixer that he had and straight down to DAT. And then we would bounce the DAT mix down to cassette and we'd go take that in the car. And like our big thing was we thought that like his his djembe drum had so much resonant low end that we were just cranking it up in the car like like it was an 808 kick drum. And that's what got us so excited about this stuff. You know, you... You had a car that when you turned it up, it it distorted, but it sound, sounded better. It sounded like distorting a, a tube guitar amp as you just jacked the music up to full volume, which was a lot of fun. But my my real failure moment was that it was Rockstars. It was my first time using a ribbon mic, believe it or not. He had loaned me ribbon mics, and I didn't know anything about them. And I had absolutely no idea you weren't supposed to feed the ribbon mics phantom power and sadly, I destroyed his mics by turning the phantom power on this mixer and, and uh, blending everything down and returned them to him broken, and I didn't even know it. So I feel bad about that. Now I really got to remember his name. Wow. So, um, all right. So we did this stuff with Nyema, and then uh, that was one of the first things we recorded. And then we did some other trips um, and went back out and recorded, you know, we got recorded um Shorty and uh, you know the the raconteurs in North Carolina and uh, and got together with Jerry Adams and and the old depot where we were recording all the old time music. Um, do you want to sort of share some of the people? Just give us a quick recap of some of these amazing characters that we met on the road and got a chance to record on those trips. It was kind of interesting because we were used to doing routing gigs. You know, you, you you're gonna play New York and you're gonna play Boston. Um, and so what's in between and you have to get to New York and back from Boston. Uh, so we did the similar thing with, uh, who Bella two, which became poetry scores where, okay, we're going to record Roscoe Gordon because Kevin Rowe, a uh, great music critic from New York now in advertising, he told us about Roscoe. So we're going to do Roscoe and that's in, in New York and we were going to do Nyema. He's in Boston. So uh, we have to get from New York to Boston. It's always better, of course, to have a routing gig, a place to stop, uh, you know, water the troops, uh, get some sleep, uh, make some new friends, and uh, you develop your audience. So the same thing for Hubella, too. So well, obviously, you know, Connecticut is in the middle. And I was a, uh, I've always been a journalist, and I was doing a lot of book reviews then mm-hmm. and for The Nation magazine in New York. And I'd gotten to know a lot of independent publishers as friends. And there was Curbstone Press in Willimantic, Connecticut, which is you know, smack dam in the middle uh, yeah, between New York yeah. and Boston. So I contacted them, and they set up some poets for us. Uh, they were well-known for revolutionary Latin American uh, poetry and literature from the Latin American perspective Great during stuff. the time 
during the time of the dirty wars in Central America, which unfortunately I worked for Reagan's Navy that was uh, perpetrating those wars, uh, incidentally. They also did Vietnamese literature and translation from the Vietnamese side. And then they did some local stuff because they wanted to be relevant to where they were locally and, frankly, to get some you know, Connecticut State art dollars. So they uh, got one of their poets elected, Poet Laureate of Connecticut. He was Leo Canellan uh, from Rock, Rockland, Maine, uh, and also had lived in New York for many years and was kind of a New York poet. Uh, Leo was one of just several poets who read for us uh, the one night, our routing gig in, in Willimantic. I remember that. We also then we did some uh, we recorded a one man band Eric Royer, uh, he was also in he was in rocks uh, in Dorchester, in in the Boston area. We did some poets in New York at Nate Shaw's uh, studio mm-hmm. home at the time his piano, and out of that we had some real great lasting uh, friendships and connections. We recorded uh, some people in North Carolina, Lidge mentioned, and I was uh, pretty familiar in Western North Carolina because I've also done a lot to revive the career of Bascom Lamar Lunsford. Uh, I instigated the 1994 uh, Smithsonian Folkways reissue of Bascom Lamar Lunsford, and I've prepared a box set, and Grail Marcus wrote the intro to it, and Robert Plant wrote a blurb, and it's been stalled forever at Smithsonian Folkways, but that's another story. So around Bascom country, where I was well known, uh, we were able to, uh, w- w- let me say, Bascom's daughter, the now late uh, Joe Heron. <laughs> yeah, Joe. Uh, she was very uh, influential to us, and she's the kind of person that uh, in- anyone you would introduce her to in Western North Carolina would take very good care of you. Uh, Jerry Adams <clears throat> was the uh, pharmacist that had a studio. And let me just right. say one thing before I give this back to Lidge. Jerry said something very, very deep that rock star uh, recording studio rock stars can benefit from. I asked him what was his approach to charging. How, how did he come up with his rates for charging the musicians he recorded? This is a pharmacist who made a good living, uh, didn't have to pay, get paid to do it. But he said, well, uh, I reckon if I don't charge anybody, they can't be that unhappy with my work. <laughs> That's that's a tough one. I'm not sure if that teaches a really valuable lesson or just sort of avoids avoids learning one too. But it's true. I mean, if you don't charge for it, then certainly uh, nobody can complain too hard. Although I think I've met people that have anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's back up just a hair here. Well, there's so many stops to back up to. But Joe Heron, remember she had that beautiful little A-frame. It was like a sh- an A-frame shack out in the yard. And I think it was meant to just sort of store um, logs of wood for, uh, for the fireplace or something like that. And so, uh, and we stayed out there. So we were staying with her. The weather was, was still nice enough that we could just kind of camp out there. And we set up our studio in, inside the A-frame and recorded um, songs in there. And that was one of the things that I really loved about those travels is that we mixed it up. So we would record all these other people, but every time we got a break, we would have the stuff set up and we'd just go ahead and, you know, record some version of some song we were working on ourselves along the way. And it was just a lot of fun, man. It was, it was a lot of fun. And it's crazy that now it's so much easier to set up a portable recording studio with a laptop and two microphones and a little, you know, USB interface compared to what it was back then. Um, Let me speak to that, Lidge. Yeah. Uh, sorry to cut in, but we took Rick Hawkins with us, a great friend of ours from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, uh, whose who's band Jackson Pollock Microphone you can find and you should listen to. Rick's a very special person. Uh, he's a videographer, among other uh, things, and uh, also teaches special education in innovative ways and is a, a great, great supporter of ours. Rick did video uh, of, of, of one of these early trips, and he shot video of, of all the work that Lidge, and he did it single-handedly, uh, he put into <laughs> getting an entire studio before studios were portable by any reckoning out of a car top carrier on top of an 87 Chevy Cavalier, <laughs> lugging it all into, and he didn't trust me to carry stuff or set stuff up. He just said, you know, get lost, do your own thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. So he would carry it all in, set it all up. I mean, that is four hours, really, three or four hours of work. And then, of course, the next day, we, we all did one one night stands mostly. So the next day or that night, he, he, he packs it all back in and we have to do it again the next day. 
Oh man, that was, I forgot about that. Yeah. He had, had some great stop motion stuff. Even then, like even just yeah. capturing video was a real pain in the ass back then compared to just setting up an iPhone now. Um, well, if anyone comes and visits with me in the Skunter Museum, I have Rick's uh, VHS tape that I could play. All right, Groovy. And I'll, I'll sort of take this as my prompt to uh, get my act together and collect, uh, you know, digitize this stuff and, and be able to share it. Well, so um, let's talk also briefly about meeting Roscoe Gordon, because that was a big, big deal for us. Um, you had a friend who was a writer who introduced you to him, and then we went and and sort of showed up at his apartment in Queens. That was the beginning, and uh, I'm going to back as perfect as a lead in that that was. I'm going to back into it from the very end. Uh, not with Kevin Rowe, the print journalist that introduced us to Roscoe, but with uh, DJ Mohair Slim, who was a uh, ska, and, and truly in this case, yes, was a ska DJ in Melbourne, Australia. And he was the biggest uh, Roscoe Gordon fan on the face of the earth and played Roscoe and sought me out, uh, did, did, did stories about our doing uh, Roscoe's last record, No Darkness in America, came to stay with me in New York and I introduced him to Roscoe. Here in the Skunter Museum, I can see his favorite football team scarf uh, dangling from a wire uh, within my my view. When when Roscoe passed, and I told uh, Lloyd DeVar is his name, but I, I told I told Mohair Slim that Roscoe was gone. And he said, it's like the gone world is finally gone. He said, when you introduced me to Roscoe, it's like going back in time and meeting Captain Kidd and actually serving with him and you know going down the ocean <laughs> with Captain Kidd. This is somebody that isn't supposed to be here anymore. And here he is exactly as he always was. Yeah. So, you know, going to say we, Roscoe was living in a high rise Lafrax city in Queens, New York, but he was from Mississippi, South of Memphis, another part of the country that we got to know very well and did some uh, folklore stuff uh, down in Senatobia, Mississippi. That's kind of where Roscoe was from. And he uh, came up the same time as B.B. Uh, B. King, then called Riley King. And it was King Biscuit Flower Hour time. And you got on the radio. And if you if it was good, you made a record. Mm. He actually had Sam Phillips' first number one hit before Elvis, uh, before Sun Studios, when Sam had a different company. And there's a famous picture of a very young Elvis with Roscoe Gordon, who was four or five years older than him, Roscoe had the number one hit in the world at that time with Booted. And Elvis wanted his picture taken with the great Roscoe Gordon. Yeah, so that's wild. Yeah, and the chicken, uh, Butch the Chicken, I th I believe is where the Sun logo probably ultimately came from because that was his hit where Roscoe would tour with a chicken. He got the chicken drunk. He got the chicken drunk. He'd put whiskey in the thimble or in the, uh, you know, in the cap and put it up on top of the piano and then the chicken would drink the whiskey and it would go around trying to shake its head and uh, and do a dance from it. <laughs> but, but Butch Butch drank himself to death. He got what Roscoe called the limber neck. Oh, and, no. and that, that was what, like, uh, you know, religious friend uh, Tommy from Government Cheese. Yeah, Tommy, Tommy Womack, yeah. Tommy Womack wrote this great book, uh, The Cheese Chronicles, we both like. And Tommy writes about getting gig neck <laughs> 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 when you get to have too much to drink and rock out too hard. Well, uh, Chuck got the uh, chicken version of Gig Neck and, and passed. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Butch, man. Butch, not Chuck. All right, so let's, um, well, so, to, to wrap up with Roscoe, so that became um, No Dark. I still think it's No Dark in America. You're, you're saying No Darkness. Either way, it's that record. And I think um, you're right. I it, think I was wrong to correct you. It's, it's quite all right. It's no worries at all. But the... Um, that record, I ended up finishing with you, um, and I kind of brought it down to Nashville, and I added all these additional musicians on it, and it took another eight years for me to finish that record. Um, speaking of taking your sweet time with things, in fact, it's, I'm embarrassed to say it, but it, it took me so long that when I released it as Roscoe's last ro record, it was posthumously because Roscoe had passed a couple of years before I finally finished it and found a record label. Um, Lidge? Yeah. Dual, dual tone. Dual can tone, I, yeah. Can I, can I tell the Grammy story as oh, I remember do. it? Yeah, yeah, please do. And this may or may not be true. This is, this is one that I, you know, roll out after a few too many beers. I submit to you that Jack White robbed us of a Grammy 
<laughs> for comeback of the year artist. <laughs> and this is my story, and I'm sticking to it. According to me, Dual Tone Records out of Nashville was in communication with Lidge and me saying, hey, the Grammys are not exactly a racket, but it's a small world. Everyone's talking. We have a chance for comeback of the year. Dual Tone, we invest in two or three Grammy projects every year. By invest, we mean take out full-page ads in the trades. It's part of the game. If you're contending, you, you kind of sweeten the pot. So we usually go for, you know, country and new country. But this year, we're going to just do one country, and we're going to do comeback of the year because Roscoe can win. Uh, get your tuxes. You're going to go to the Grammys. You're going to win a Grammy. That's so awesome. Then <laughs> Jack White drops – Loretta Lynn's comeback record. Oh, yeah. Late in the Grammy season, and the call comes from Dual Tone. You made a better record than Jack White, and Jack White made a better comeback record because it's Loretta Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> Cancel the tuxedos. You're not going to Los Angeles, and you're not going to win a Grammy. And Jack White and Loretta Lynn got the Grammy for comeback of the year. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. I had totally forgotten about that. But I what, think that's what a good true. story. You could ask Joey and people at Dual Tone. As far as I'm aware, what I told you is something that actually happened to us. It's good enough for me, man. Stories are what it's all about anyway. So, so Roscoe, um, uh, where was I going? So we finished the Roscoe record, but I wanted to also share that Roscoe, the reason why the Scott DJ was speaking to you about this and so excited was because Roscoe was considered the father of ska music because the jump blues style that he created from Memphis um, and was pressed on so many 45s went down to the jukeboxes in Jamaica. And that was the music that they were listening to down there that gave it that upbeat jump and, and influenced I don't know, you know, I haven't heard anybody say, did it influence reggae as well as ska, or it just kind of sped it up yes. and influenced the ska yes. as well? Yes, I have, I have the definitive source on this, okay? Right. So uh, while Roscoe was alive, he took me to uh, Manhattan, down by the um, down by the produce district. The, uh, the Ramblers, the Midnight Ramblers, had a Pacifica radio show, and these guys were two hardcore uh, Jamaican. They're from Jamaica DJs, and they were they had the best you know reggae show in the United States. It's fair to say. And I'd gone on the radio with Roscoe, and they knew that Lidge and I were making this record. They had Roscoe on every year. When Roscoe passed, they reached out to me and they said, we're going to do a memorial show. We want you to be on the show. And so I, I did. I, I went on the show. And when they, they introduced me and they were queuing up who Roscoe was, they said, Roscoe was the seed of reggae. Nice. The seed is primary to the root. Do you understand? The seed is older than the root. Roscoe is not the root of reggae. He was the seed. That's great. I'm sorry, all my voices sound like Boris from Rocky and Bullwinkle, but uh, as they explained to me, and I actually have in the Skunter Museum where I speak, and Lit Lit should digitize this as well, I have this broadcast, this radio broadcast of the Midnight Ramblers, and one thing they do is they play all of these covers of Roscoe songs in Jamaica where they speed up the beat to get ska, and then they slow it down to get rock steady, and then they slow it down further to get reggae. The beats of ska, rock steady, and reggae are innovated by Jamaican musicians covering Roscoe Gordon. And I actually have cassettes that document this from the Midnight Ramblers. That's great, man. I'm so glad you told that story. As always, you're a master storyteller, and so I'm glad to have you here sharing this stuff. So now let's come forward and talk about you going back to St. Louis and, you know, this kind of aha moment for you of, well, I mean, even before that, coming back from recording Leo Canellan, the Poet Laureate of Connecticut, you know, his master poet from Maine, and his epic piece, Crossing America, and your aha, which became our mutual aha moment in the car, was realizing, hey, we should take this and score music around the entire thing and that is what you know gave birth to poetry scores. Can you talk about that transition and, and yeah, how that all came about? Yeah, there's several moving parts. I'll try to be brief. Uh, on that first trip, or maybe the second Hubella 2 trip, we recorded Leo Canellan at Curbstone Press in Willimantic, as, as I had said. At that point, he did a bunch of short poems, which is what we'd ask for, I think. And we took a break to eat pizza. There was this Puerto Rican pizzeria. And Lidge was very smart. This is a rock star uh, recording technique. Very important. Leave it running no matter what you tell the people. In fact, tell them it's not running and leave it running. Not to burn them, but but they get you get better stuff when people don't know your your 
you're capturing it. So Leo says, well, I, you're a young man, and I'll read you my young man, in the, you know, I'll read you my young man poem. I hitchhiked through 49 of the 50 states, and I was in San Francisco before Ginsburg. And, uh, and he reads us the last part of his poem, Crossing America, which is 1976, centennial poem. And the end of it is basically the story of how a bum date rapes a bag lady. As grim as that sounds, it really is a great, moving piece of poetry. Oh, yeah. One of the lines from it that I that stuck into all of us first before we actually knew what it was about, because we're listening to it in the car, driving to the next gig, was, he was right, and <laughs> she was right. One of my favorite and, lines ever. And, and, and every person that ever shared a life with someone of the opposite sex, he was right, and she was right. And that's a story about a bum that date rapes a bag lady. It's a grisly story, but we loved it. So we uh, told Leo we loved it. He said it's part of a longer poem. He sends us Crossing America, the entire poem. Lidge and I are crazy enough. We drive all the way back to Willamette, <laughs> Connecticut to record him reading the entire thing. And again, we're gig, you know, we're gig booking and uh, car jamming that. And, you know, car jamming and gig booking are really great things that I think all musicians and producers discover. You take it out in the car, of course, but you also gig book it. Someone takes notes, even on your phone or on it. We always had an actual gig book. Really write it out and, and plan out your future with these recordings. So we noticed it was half the length of a CD. We still thought of CDs all the time then. Mm -hmm. CDs about 76 minutes. It was half that, 37-minute reading. So we just immediately together collectively decided we would you know, commission and then go around the country really retracing Leo's steps and record snippets of people playing music that they'd written uh, in response to the poetry. And we did. You know, Nate Shaw, his brother, all over the country recorded people uh, playing music. That was, that so, was so much part. fun, man. We'll come back to it, but I want to talk about all those recordings too. So that record, we made a record. We first of all, we pooled in money. So that's that's another recording studio rock star technique. You we put we some, had money. <laughs> well, yeah, you have to put some skin in the game. We all put in like a thousand dollars to release Crossing America. It's a beautiful deluxe package. This is an aside. I said I'd be brief, but Crossing America, the physical package, was designed by Jeff Tremaine, the founding producer of Jackass. I didn't know that. I didn't realize Jeff was in that. Jeff Tremaine went to college with us as good friends with Matt Fuller, our art director, if you will. Mm -hmm. And before Jackass, when Jeff was recording crazy skateboard videos for Larry Flint as a little fun thing, he was working for Larry Flint as a graphic designer, and he was and the web was kind of new, and new media was new, <laughs> and he was doing crazy j skateboard stunts that turned into Jackass, okay? Yeah. Jeff Tremaine on Larry Flint's computers laid out and helped Matt digitally design the packaging to crossing America. I love we it. print like a thousand of this thing. I and mean, who do we think we are? I, you know, I'm the marketing guy. Lidge since surpassed me, but then I was the marketing guy. I sent it to the BBC, right? I finally got a spoken word show called the verb on radio three and they call me and they do a feature. That's right. This was very critical. I mentioned our good luck. So without Steve Pick's feature in the daily newspaper in St. Louis, Enormous Richard doesn't ever do a second gig. Without the verb doing a feature on Crossing America, there's no poetry scores. But we looked at each other and we said, we've been doing all of this stuff all of this time and we've gotten nowhere, more or less nowhere, in the industry nowhere. We do one poetry record, we're on the BBC let's do poetry records. And that's all we've done ever since in one respect. Yeah. So what we had was Leo's reading of Crossing America. It was how many parts was it? About 27? It is 27. Poems? Yeah. So, and then we looked at that and we thought, well, we don't want to mess with, I mean, his reading is so good. When he reads his poem, it actually- We hitchhiked America. It was- I still think of her. Yeah. There, there was a thing that I talk about sometimes when favorite records- sometimes take multiple listens before you get it. And then when you get it, you're done. You're done for because you can't stop listening. You know, Leo was like that for me. Initially, I loved the sound of his voice and the way he did it, but I didn't understand the words. It's that deep, you know? Um, and it took multiple listenings. But once I got it, I was like, holy shit, man, this stuff is so good. And his reading voice is so fantastic because he doesn't he Say doesn't it, he doesn't put on airs you know oh yeah <laughs> who does he sound like oh you mean like elmer fudd <laughs> he does have we a little bit of a thing. america 
I still think of her. <laughs> yeah. I walk the old trees thinking I streets thinking I see her, but never. Um, New buildings have gone up. <laughs> the bartenders who poured roses into our glasses are gone. We are, are erased. erased. Yes. <laughs> Well, so we, you know, we thought about this and we were like, man, his voice sounds so good. We don't need to put anything behind it. We'll just leave it as is and we'll compose musical pieces to go in between each poem to kind of break up this long epic poem. And so that's, you know, then we, we kind of looked at each one and we said, well, this one will reflect something about this poem we just heard or going into the next one. And so we came up with these crazy ideas. I mean, one of the pieces and it was all, what was funny too is, Chris, we were, you know, we will forever be both creatively collaborating and also getting on each other's nerves slightly and like, you know, battling for the best idea. But, you know, here we are like duking it out with, with the gig book about what needs to go into a poem uh, with things, suggestions like this one needs a piece that's just written for tuba and wind chimes. <laughs> And we which did, we recorded. which we did, man. You found a tuba player in St. Louis and a wind chimist, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, sure enough, you know, threw all my studio in the car. And, you know, I would always have to drive from Nashville all the way up to St. Louis to come meet with you before we even hit the road and do these trips. But we did that, you know, tuba and wind chimes. <laughs> there was another one where we recorded, we needed a, a bog full of frogs and so we took a portable recorder out and we set up, you know, in a muddy bog to try and catch the frogs, but the frogs wouldn't make any noise. So we ended up recording a frogless bog. Or no, did we want it to have no frogs? I can't remember. But we got a we got a frogless bog in the end, you know. No, there's an important detail to this that made it seem like something mystical had happened because we're trying to record frogs. And they're not singing for us. But while we're rolling, a plane, a jet plane, passes overhead. Right. We're in Horseshoe Lake, which is an, an oxbow bend lake of the Mississippi River on the metro east across from St. Louis. It's in the flight path of two airports. And a jet plane goes by. And we looked at each other and we just, we knew we had it. We shook our heads. Because the poem says, I have called the frogs in from singing in bogs. So the frogs aren't singing. They've been called in. And the poem says, it's lost in ascent to the stars, and which is perfect. So we called it Lost in Ascent, and we actually recorded a jet plane descending in a frogless bog. Yes, I remember thinking that it somehow represented the, you know, the man's journey to outer space, which is referenced in the poem, too, in the ascent to the stars. And, and technology like destroying nature. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting stuff. What else here? Tell us about another, the most bizarre song that we recorded other than those two on there. Uh, on Crossing America? Yeah. Yeah. What, what was another really strange one? Well, we, you know, we were pretty ambitious in those days. So we actually got a brass band uh, to arrange Sousa, a Sousa march for this very brief, because we wanted each musical interlude to be the same length as the poem before it. First of all, that would make sure it stayed within the, the time length of the CD. So we got a, you know, a local kind of, you know, beer hall brass band to do little bizarre snippets of Sousa marches where they play parts of every turnaround. And it sounds really crazy when you hear it back. We also did full band country recordings, which was real fun. Uh, Brian Henneman mm -hmm. of Bottle Rockets, um, originally Ch Chicken Truck back in the old days in St. Louis, he sings a song that we wrote. Uh, I actually wrote that one myself. Fred Friction, who we love here in St. Louis, sings one of the songs that I wrote. Yeah. It was really fun. Well, so then, Rockstars, we took this, uh, which is now uh, 54 pieces on a record, and I took all of this to a local mastering guy down here, Jim Demain of he has Yes Master as his facility, and I show up, and of course, you know, I show up. I'm like, hey man, we don't have a lot of money to master this. Can you do this record for us? Sure, you know, I don't think he was expecting me to show up with 54 songs, but we sat down and we hammered this thing out, and it was so much fun, and it was so unusual to try and balance. 27 poetry pieces with an additional 27 musical bits 
with so much variety and different sounds. I mean, like mastering a frogless bog and <laughs> trying to get that to sound just right on a record was uh, definitely an unparalleled experience for me. Well, so, you know, this was the birth of that idea of the poetry scores for us. Chris, tell us about moving to St. Louis and ultimately finding this collective of, of artists to create with and continue on indefinitely. Yeah, thanks. This is kind of a, I think, a motivational speech for your rock stars who aren't in bigger cities. Uh, St. Louis is def- certainly a second tier. <laughs> Some would say third tier city if you're into elitist rankings by tier, which I'm not so much. What I always found about St. Louis and its weaknesses in, in industry terms uh, are some of its strengths in creative terms. Because, I mean, you can't, for the most part, a few do, but you can't make a living off music if you live in St. Louis. I mean, you just you have to leave to make a living off it. And that is a shame in many respects because people should make a living if they're good at making music. But on the other hand, it's really a benefit because people are not looking to get paid. So if you have a good idea and you're not making money off it, they'll play with you for free. When I lived in New York, I found you paid for rehearsals uh, and, and they had to be paid at the gig. And that's I could never do it on that budget. So uh, we flourished here because people were willing to play because it was fun to do. You know, musicians, visual artists, filmmakers, actors, uh, chefs. We we translated poetry into beer, food, music, happenings, films, visual art, you name it. And all basically no money in, no money out. No one gets paid. We don't collect any money. No one pays any money to experience it. Well, so now talk about the process from discovering a poem through um, the art fundraising, or I forget what you call it when you have the art show. Art Invitational. The Art Invitational. So talk about that creation process from one through the other, through film to the Art Invitational. Yeah, so here's a classic uh, poetry scores evolution, and they're not all this way, and they're all a little different. But a classic one would be you pick a poem, and you set it to music, and we favor sung text over spoken word. And that's a departure from Crossing America, which was spoken word with music. Mm-hmm. And we have repeated that uh, pattern. But for the most part, we like to treat the poetry as a lyric sheet. Mm-hmm. And when you're done with it, it sounds like a record. You wouldn't know it was started as poetry unless you read the liner notes. So you have a record and then you... Um, well, hold release- on, let's back up for just one sec. So, But you're inviting uh, uh, various people in to convert the, the poems into song, right? Yeah, we've done different things. We've done it all ourselves. We've done it ourselves and, and, and sort of patched some holes that we couldn't score or didn't get around to scoring with a secondary uh, music that we borrow or commission. And then we've done full-blown uh, anthology-style commissions where we ask a group of poets to respond to the same poetry and we, and we you know, divide it up and make sure everyone scores something different. So we've done it all of those ways. And then we released the CD with an art invitational. And the art invitational idea started with another, you know, problem. And they say a peak is always uh, next to the pit. That's something Joe Heron, Bascom's daughter, told us in North Carolina. The peak is next to the pit because uh, our poets were dying. You know, Leo died while we were making his record. Mm-hmm. Ijaya Han, uh, author of Blind Cat Black, died while we were making his record. So we didn't have a live poet to do live gigs. So uh, we had the idea of having visual artists. Uh, adapt the same poem to visual art. And then uh, we, they would title their piece after a verbatim quote from the poem. And where their quote fit into the flow of the language of the poem dictates where the piece hangs in the show. So a title from the first line is at the beginning of the show. A title from the last line is at the end of the show. And then we would auction off or later uh, sell it at, at a flat price, the visual art from the show, split it with the artist and the venue, and have some money to do something else with it. And the something else we decided to do was make silent films. We always love silent movies to live music. We had all these pieces of music we called scores, poetry scores, and we love silent films. So we shot and edited uh, two uh, feature length silent films to two of our poems. And along the way, we would do other things like we would take a poem that had a lot of food references and, and make a meal using only that food. Uh, uh, we have done selfies. We did a, a poem <laughs> called uh, Ten Dreamers in a Motel by um, the great late the late great Josephine Miles. And we had everyone take a selfie of themselves in a motel. So you had all these people renting motel rooms for the night and, and kind of having fun with it. That's great. 
Um, well, it's such cool stuff, man. And I love how you just created a community around bringing people together and creating this stuff and just tie it all together like that. And I look forward to just continuing to make more records this way. And, uh, you know, you guys are going to be down here. Hopefully this year we'll be working on a new piece and, and putting um, music to poetry and continue the tradition. It's a cool, yeah, it, cool way to keep going. Yeah. It, to me, it stays a little bit um, in the feeling of being in a traveling rock band and, and being a traveling rock band, it's like being in a traveling theater troupe in a sense, because there is a shared text. Uh, if you're a theater troupe, it's the play you're performing. If you're a band, it's your set list, which changes a little bit over a tour usually, but you're in this collective, you're under this collective spell and you're traveling together. Poetry scores recreates that spell in a more sedentary form. We don't travel uh, a little, but not as much, nearly as much, but it's like, we're all traveling together under the umbrella of this poem. We kind of live together, uh, a large group of artists in various medium uh, media. We live together in the same poem for the life of these projects. And it creates a bond that is very deep and very uh, unusual and very, uh, very beautiful. So cool. Well, all right, we're going to take a break here and we'll come back for the jam session. Thanks for sharing all that stuff, Chris. Rockstars, I want to remind you that I'll have links to stuff we're talking about in the show notes, which you can find at rsrockstars.com. And then you could just search Chris King and I'll take you right to the blog post. And um, if you enjoyed the music going into this too, uh, you can find the theme music for the podcast at skadooshmusic.com, which is S-K-A-D-O-O-S-H, music.com. And I'll include stuff from uh, our bands and our records and poetry scores and everything as, as best I can right in the show notes, uh, links to YouTube videos and that sort of thing. So we'll take a break and we'll see you guys in just a moment for the jam session. Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks and you get downloadable multi-tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi-track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars, we're back. We're about to jump into the jam session. My guest today is Chris King, my old brother in music and friend from St. Louis, and many bands I've been playing in for decades. Um, and we're going to jump into the jam session. Chris, are you ready to jam? Yes, sir. Sweet. All right, man. Tell us, when you got started out in recording and music, what was holding you back? I couldn't sing uh, and I couldn't play music, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I really wanted to. You know, I grew up doodling stage plots, pictures of musicians, uh, set, imaginary set lists, imaginary band names. Uh, in it. But I wanted to do it so bad that I convinced people to do it with me. That's great, man. Did you ever doodle the Van Halen logo on your um, notebook in school? I, I must have. <laughs> what do you think was the number one logo that you would have doodled back then? I was crazy about the doors. Nice. Yeah. All right, man. So t now how about sharing with us some of the best advice you received? You know, it, it, people were really very generous with me. Um, 
the doors were something I jammed on with uh, Jerome Coyle, who is a I had older sisters who had older boyfriends, so it's kind of interesting. I always had these older uh, people who knew a lot more about music. Uh, and Jerome, I wrote a song. It was very simple. First time I ever picked up guitar. It, 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 I can still remember what it was, and it really was not. There was no nothing there. And Jerome just says, "Hey, boy, keep it up." <laughs> you know, and when I made our first movie for Poetry Scores, it was really not a very good movie technically. And Cliff Fralick of uh, Cinema St. Louis screened it. He played it for us. He let it play publicly. Um, and when he critiqued it for me, he says, first of all, keep doing this, make more movies. But, and then he shredded it, you know, right. but he said, first of all, you're this, you'll, you'll get good at this if you keep doing this, make more movies. But this was terrible. So <laughs> I was always encouraged like that. I love it. Hey boy, keep it up. That's yeah, that was quote. it. And that made a lot to me. It did mean a lot to me. I, obviously, I still remember it. You know, that's advice that's been shared on this podcast a number of times is that, you know, the biggest secret to success is persistence. You know, you were, um, you said a lot of smart stuff when we were arguing about keeping going and you really wanted to keep going. And we didn't as a band, as you mentioned earlier. And you just said, look, man, look at Uncle Tupelo. What they didn't do was they never tried to make it as something else. If you're going to make it, you just decide you're going to make it, and then you make it. Look at Jeff Tweedy. You know, we grew up with Jeff Tweedy playing music with him. Tweedy never was going to do anything but play music. In a way, he didn't have other options. He wasn't educated. Now, Jeff's a smart guy. He could have done a lot of other things, but he did not know that, trust me, when we were 20 years old. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, so rock stars, take that to the wherever you need to take it. <laughs> It's good advice. Whatever you want to do, whatever you love doing, whatever you're passionate about, just stick to it. Keep at it. All right. So now how about um, sharing with us, uh, Chris, I know that you don't consider yourself in the same way that Jeff may not have considered himself a smart guy, like you said um, at that time, you probably have never considered yourself an engineer and a technician, but do share with us a recording tip hack or secret sauce, because I know you've learned a lot about making records, something that the rock stars could use today on the next record they make. Well, one thing I would do when Lidge was setting up the studio, which as I mentioned, he would positively not let me help him do, because I made it worse and slower. Uh, I would often um, go get food and cook it. It's really good to cook with your uh, the people you're making music with and eat with them together. You know, don't always call out for pizza, uh, and also you know provide something with nutrition. Uh, uh, Lidge and we'll we'll put a, a a recipe for jollof rice in with this podcast. I love but, it. I love it. Uh, Nyema Kuma taught us when he told us pizza was not food. He taught us how to make this incredibly nutritious uh, meal. It's basically rice and whatever meat you have. He liked doing neck bones of a lamb. And, and smoked uh, turkey wings. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's got to have hot peppers in it. And pepper soup is really good. I must say that our man, Eleanor Roosevelt, made a record called Pepper Soup and Local Honey, which was a Nyemakuma advice for health. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the pepper soup makes you evacuate, makes you blow your nose and get stuff out of your system. And honey is a, uh, helps your immune system from you know, uh, with local pollens and things. So uh, make people comfortable and, and feed them a little bit. We also wrote a song called, uh, or had a record called Water, Bread, and Beer, which that pepper soup and local honey is on. And uh, that maybe wasn't quite as healthy, but we did find that those tended to be staples of our, our <laughs> gigging and songwriting and traveling needs. Well, remember, if you're traveling, a really healthy sandwich, uh, really nutritious, is uh, peanut butter, banana, and honey. I'll take uh, it. I'll take Peanut it. butter has your uh, your um, obviously your protein, and the banana has uh, some good stuff in it and some sugars. And honey is good for your immune system. It's really nutritious and uh, gets you down the road. All right, cool. So now this next question is for you to share a, um, something physical, a favorite hardware tool that you're always glad you've got it when you're making records. And if you don't mention it, I want you to also tell us about Gigas Pocus. That's it, a notebook. Uh, I like, uh, I have a phone like everyone else and it has a note uh, function on it and I use it and I'm really glad to have it. But what you really should have is a 
physical notebook with a sturdy cover, something that can take a beating. And not only is it nice to not be looking at a screen all the time and you know be burning up your batteries, also sometimes you're using your phone to do uh, your voice memo function to record a session, which we do all the time. So a, a, a physical notebook. The other thing is hold on to them and you look back on them. I keep all of ours. I have crates of them. And it's just so exciting for me to go back through them. And I'm like, I'm in the van and Lid just sitting right next to me and he's playing, he's got a Skeletor mask on and he's playing a melodica. <laughs> and I was there and these are the notes I took and it, it keeps me young. Well, so I, I've actually talked about the importance of a notebook on this podcast with other people thinking specifically about you. I remember when you first, when we were in school and you first sort of fancied yourself a writer or a writer wannabe, you said that you got advice from other experienced writers that you have to have a notebook and you have to carry it with you all the time. And you started doing that. And sure enough, you've always had a notebook around ever since then. Um, and one of the things that I have seen you do is you'll have a notebook out and you can just kind of open it randomly and stumble across uh, bits and pieces of ideas that you may have written down, and it begins to recontextualize things and allow you to try and see if they fit with the music that ha that's happening right in that moment. And I've always suspected that, that that might be hard to do or impossible to do with digital technology, whereas an actual physical notebook makes that kind of thing much easier. I have a historical riff on this that I've never told you. I'm so glad um, I get to tell you, Lidge. One of the many uh, ancestors and, and mentors of poetry scores is a man named Leonard Barkin, who's a distinguished faculty member at Princeton University. Mm -hmm. And he wrote about uh, ekphrasis or ekphrasis, which is um, basically poetry about sculpture. And that's a version of a poetry score. A poetry score is about translating poetry into other media. So in general, like moving between artistic media was something I learned from uh, Leonard uh, with the concept, uh, concepts, excuse me, the concept of ekphrasis. I, uh, paid some bills for years, uh, copy editing and line editing Leonard's great books. And I, uh, I'm proud to say I titled one of his very greatest books. And my title uh, form was Michelangelo, a life on paper. And this is a book about paper as the first social medium. In Michelangelo's studio, in other Renaissance studios, paper was very precious. It was more as precious as like a laptop or an iPhone today. You didn't throw away pieces of paper until they were completely used up. So the same piece of paper would be in the same studio for decades. And there are pieces of paper that have some of the most famous Michelangelo drawings you've ever seen. It's burned into your brain right now. Sketches for the Statue David, uh, sketches for the ceiling of the Vatican. And uh, yet next to it is literally a laundry list or a shopping list. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it, our, our gig books are obviously our version of that. Uh, this is sort of uh, taking it on an aside a little bit, but when we were doing all of our travels and field recordings, we didn't have the tools that we have now. We didn't have a laptop. We didn't have cell phones and smartphones. Yeah. And we didn't even really have digital cameras. So the only way that we captured stuff, although we did, you know, Rick brought his video camera at that on one trip, but we, you know, used to travel with a Polaroid and we used to sort of stage po important Polaroid shots. And more importantly, is that our, our good friend uh, and bandmate and creative collaborator, Matt Fuller, came with us on these trips and he was the sketch artist. You know, he would break out these pads of paper and he would just sketch what was happening in that moment. And you just can't replace that stuff with just taking a cell phone shot, you know? Well, Lidge had me uh, narrate, and I appreciate that, my environment here in the Skunk Museum office. And I'm looking on the wall right now and I see a Matt Fuller sketch of Barney, well, we named everything. It was a barn in Pulteney, Vermont. Our record label, we have to tell our record label stories. Right, but tell it. Uh, This is the Safe House record label, which is not as good as the Fruit of the Tune story, which I must tell. But um, so Jim at Safe House Records in Pulteney, Vermont, had us up to sign a deal. And we made a record in his barn while we were there, but we never signed the deal. And it was his wife who talked us out of signing the deal, oh, no. which is unbelievable. <laughs> but I'm looking at the I'm looking at the barn and I can see the grain of the wood. And here's me in overalls 25 years ago. And there's Lidge singing. And 
And, you know, keep sketchbooks. Yes, keep sketchbooks. Uh, there's sort of a funny anecdote about that, too. I think we went up there a couple of times. This That was in the barn recording when it was warm outside, but we went back in the middle of a winter snowstorm um, the time we went with Rick, and we stayed in the... the um, in their home, which was where the record label was, but it was actually a converted uh, um, it was, nursing home. Yeah, it was a nursing home. Insufficiently converted nursing <laughs> Insufficiently home. Insufficiently converted nursing home. And so this one memory I have is, you know, we had spent the evening doing like we were wont to do. We we drank quite a bit of beer and wrote quite a lot of music and had a really good time. And then when it was time to go to sleep, we just, you know, threw our sleeping bags down on the ground. Well, there I was sleeping in one of the rooms that was, you know, had been a nursing room uh, that never really got cleaned up and, and reconverted for living. And I just had my face down on this old carpet that I don't know what it had in it, but... I woke up the next morning not feeling very well, man. So <laughs> sometimes you got to really give, you know, for your art. I remember that morning there. I, I still have images and notebooks. I, I remember saying, Lidge's eyes look like miles of feathers and broken glass. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, man. So uh, we have just, just on the heels of explaining all the reasons why you have to use important things like Polaroids, sketch pads, and notebooks. My next question is, share with us a favorite software tool, something that you've found very helpful inside the computer for creativity, for uh, making records. Yeah. Um, for me, it's, it's probably going to be uh, web, web tools and a uh, great believer in box.com. I was an early adopter and box seems to have quietly put me on some ultimate grandfather list. I mean, I could, I could upload the big bang uh, that started the universe on box and they would just put it up there for free. <laughs> I think I've uploaded so much stuff and sent so many leaks and created so many downloads that there's nothing box won't put up for me for free. I can't promise you you're going to get on the ground floor. Uh, but I like box. We transfer.com. I mean, if you're not using that to send your large files, I, the first poetry scores movie, uh, 60 minute feature film, uh, I can send you a, I could send people that through we transfer.com. It takes me about 40 minutes to send takes them about 20 minutes to download and you got a feature film. What a great, great service. Yeah. Free. Well, you know, it's funny too. Again, you, you sort of, uh, call yourself not really in the technical, um, but yet you were the first person I know who was using email. So back when we were doing this stuff, in fact, when we were doing these, these early travels and the internet was like barely a thing, you were already using email and that's how you were reaching out to people. That's how we found Roscoe. That's how we connected with Philip Yampolsky and met with him up in Connecticut. Um, so Rockstars Philip was somebody that we reached out to on this trip because we had been listening to his collection of Indonesian field recordings for Smithsonian folkways for Smithsonian folkways. And we went and met with this guy, this guy, I, I he had like a, an arrangement with this label to go to Indonesia and record 20 full length CDs over probably 20 years. Unforgettable. I've got them all really incredible stuff too. So, um, now, yeah, so you, you've also, all, you always knock me out with your ability to adopt things, to claim you didn't know how to do tech stuff and then use the shit out of something like email before anybody even knew what it was. I, I want to come back to email, but uh, Philip Ampolsky also uh, was a Niamakuma figure. Uh, he had, a, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name, but his wife was, I believe, Indonesian. And she made us the greatest homemade Indonesian chicken soup. Remember that? That's right. I do. I do. Let me tack onto that. Another mentor figure from that same tour, David Greenberger. Oh, if you yeah. do not know the work of David Greenberger in Duplex Planet, this will be the best reason you listen to this podcast, Rock Stars. I just corresponded with David today. He's a god. I mean, he is truly a god. He's got. He's working on records with uh, Robin Hitchcock. Uh, this is spoken word music that uh, David sits with very old people, very patiently and very well makes them open up, writes down everything they say, reads it in this really great, whimsical, but very serious and loving voice, and gets the greatest musicians in the world to do music to it. And, this is very important to poetry scores. And he was smart enough to not sleep with his face planted directly down on the carpet all night long. 
But he also fed us. I remember we went by David's place and he got our pie and he made us eat it. And he's funny. He's like, well, I'm trying to move the pie when we were slow to eat it. So we, we ate all of his pie. That's email, right. okay. So I was an early adopter of Box. I was an early adopter of email. Um, rock stars, if you want to contact me, <clears throat> my email is bro dog, short for brother dog, at Hotmail. Nice. So there are a lot of other bro dogs, but I was the original. I actually got on Hotmail as an activist for the movement for the survival of the Agoni people. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that, because that was an important, it's a form of recording that you did for that. Yeah. As a, as a producer, uh, co-producer, always co I mean, it's a virtue for me that I, there's nothing I want to do alone. Um, there's nothing I'm good at, uh, on my own that I actually want to do. So everything I really want to do, I don't have the skills to do alone. And this is another really kind of motivational thing. Your deficits are your strengths because you're going to have to go find them and other people and other people are, um, going to complete you and you're in, and they're going to be better than you at many things. So, um, I love to make music, but I, I can't do it alone. Uh, it's, it's always been a, a, a great motivator uh, uh, for me. I lost my thread, Lidge. What were you asking well, me about? All right. Well, um, we were <clears> talking <throat> about software stuff, but I was about to move on to the really difficult question, which is what advice do you have for people about business? I mean, you kind of shared some straight from uh, from Jerry Adams in the past, but you know, if people want to make music and they want to sort of do it professionally, do you have any advice for them? Um. I'm, I'm kind of a commercial failure in music and uh, an amateur success. <clears throat> I prefer it that way. And I do want to tell a story about that. So we were friends with the guys in Uncle Tupelo when they got started. And uh, Jeff uh, Tweedy went on to be world famous and deservedly so. <clears throat> Jay Farrar has made a great career and deservedly so. Michael Heidorn, who's my better friend of the three, didn't stay with music, although he's in high demand. He has some physical issues uh, with his arms from overplaying all those years. But, you know, unfortunately, they all speak to each other through their lawyers. It's just the way their lives turned out. They're all, uh, I know Mike feels great affection to, to both of them and talks to them on the phone, but they, uh, when it comes to anything bus about the band, they their lawyers have to work it out. Now, uh, our, me and Lidge and Matt Fuller and John Minkoff and David Melson, our main guys, we uh, did not ever make a living off music, but uh, we've never had to refer to a lawyer when we talk to each other. So your relationships really ought to come first, I yeah, think. I think that's Your life good will advice. be better if your relationships come first. I think that's good advice. I mean, I don't think that um, you know you, anybody has to assume that they can't make a living off of their music, but I think that keeping your eye on the important thing and what comes first, like you said. I, I much more value being able to know you guys for a lifetime and make music, and I love it. Well, it, it's a tale to my, my, my thought, Lidge. I know it is anti-commercial, but if you don't make any money, you can't fight over it. That's a good point. All right, so now how about this? This is a couple of hypothetical questions, and then we're, we're done here. But this one is, um, imagine... Yeah, you might be starting over. Let's say you were in a new place and you needed something simple, some simple way to record music. Um, you needed to find people to record and make music with, and you needed to uh, make ends meet, although I think you already answered that one. What would you do? What would you, how would you record? How would you find people to record? If I had to start over, <clears throat> I watch my daughter. She's 13, and she's on all media at all times. She has a sense that all media are equal. If you're on The Voice on television in front of millions of people, if you're on YouTube with 15 or 25 views, uh, you're equal. She reads books that are bestsellers that millions of people read. She reads Wattpad, which is a great site, which is self-published authors. Uh, you know, but they have fan fiction of each other. They have whole, you know, huge people on Wattpad have huge followings, and they've never published a book. So I, I would, I would just suggest that you are an egalitarian of media, and you try a little bit of everything. I would do a. I would try a YouTube uh, video. I would um, Snapchat a concert. I would uh, Instagram pictures of myself, and I would be very supportive of other artists because we are we are in a social media environment where you really, uh, until you become the Justin Bieber that everyone's looking at, uh, you're looking at everybody else. 
Right. So use these tools to your advantage and just connect with people. But I like what you said, though. It's it's being supportive. It's a great place to start. Just show people what you appreciate about them and their music. And it's a great way to meet people and start building relationships. Listening people, really listening pe- to people yeah. is the best way to be heard. Um, all right. Now, here's the last hypothetical question. We're going to take the Wayback Studio Machine and we're going to go back in time and we're going to find young Chris King. Maybe, you're, you, maybe you've are maybe just gone AWOL and you're going to tap yourself on the shoulder. You turn around and like, whoa, what are you doing here? And you say, well, I've come to give you, to tell you the one single most important thing that you need to know to be a rock star of the recording studio one day. What would you say? Because you asked me personally about my life, I would say avoid head injuries. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, how does that play into it? I've just had a lot of head injuries, and it really set me back. This is a sub-narrative. Lidge is one of the few people that really knows how true it is. But uh, through most of our band life, and certainly all of Hubella 2, traveling on the road with all the head and neck injuries I'd had, and I could go through them, but you don't want to hear it, but I really have almost killed myself 10 or 12 times, uh, it made it hard for me to travel that rough. And so I spent a lot of time doing yoga and just and just really being in pain. So don't hurt your body because uh, you're going to need it uh, to make it as a musician or a rock star uh, recording studio guy. I think that's good advice. Taking care of yourself physically so that you can continue to do the things that you really love to do. You're a pre- you're, you are you you are your own most precious asset. Yeah, and I mean, if you feel bad, you're not going to feel like being creative. You're not going to feel like making music. You just won't want to do it. You'll just want to sit down on a chair and turn the TV on or something and zone out. So that is good advice. All right, well, Brother Dog, thank you so much for being here on Recording Studio Rockstars, man. Pidge? Yes, brother. Got to ask. Got to ask. I got to give, I got to do the fruit of the tune story. Oh, yeah, please do. Please share another story. Okay. This is true. Uh, Just like my Grammy story someone's going to have to convince me this isn't true. As hard as this is to believe, this happened. David Greenberger of Duplex Planet commissioned our band, Enormous Richard, to set to music a poem by Ernest Noyes Brookings. Ernest Noyes Brookings had been an MIT-educated engineer, late in life, uh, ended up in a assisted care facility, David Greenberger was the activities director, and he got all these elderly people doing creative things. He had Ernie writing a poem a day that David would give him a title. This went on for years, if you can believe it. And David ran out of titles, so he just did numbers, okay? So number 15 was the poem that we uh, scored. He did every letter of the alphabet. So we scored the the poem 15, uh, David sent us $150. Can you imagine how much money that was to us? Oh, that this was is like, like a career launcher. 93, 94. So we don't spend $150 on one recording. We record an entire record. Uh, we do it in a basement, Megan Gohill, his basement. I believe that's true in Maplewood. Mm-hmm. And uh, very poorly rehearsed, very, it's just a room recording. It's very murky. Also, this was right when Lidge had come back from Hong Kong. We loved Lidge. We considered him the core of the band. We had a more successful version of the band with the more uh, accessible accordion player, the great Chris Bess, later of Southern Culture on the Skids. And Chris and Lidge were, were not getting along. We'd embraced Lidge, and Chris felt unwanted and quit soon after this. So we make this murky record, and it becomes our record deal. But who gives us the deal? Fruit of the tune out of Montclair, New Jersey. We were Fruit of the Tunes' third best-selling band. The second best-selling band was Kinky Friedman, the outlaw Jewish country singer, also candidate for governor of Texas, and you know mystery crime fiction writer, Kinky Friedman, uh-huh. author of They Ain't Making Jews Like Jesus Anymore. The number one selling band of Fruit of the Tune was Charles Manson. Wow. Charles Manson. Uh- do you remember this? No, I didn't even realize we were label mates with Charles Manson. Charles Manson, everyone knows this if they know the Helter Skelter story. Uh, he made a record. He was friends with Dennis Wilson. He was a folk singer. He made a record that was never released. Fruit of the Tune was the first one to figure out that it would be possible to release it. They got a meeting with Manson. They worked it out with the state of California. 
the son of Sam law dictates that a, a convicted killer, I think rapist, there are some category A crimes or whatever. You can't profit from her, your own likeness or your own image or any of your own creative work. They had to create a foundation. So there's basically a Charles Manson foundation that gives its you have to pay him royalties, but he can't profit from it. So there's a foundation that's collected money and given away to good causes and through the tomb sold the shit out of Charles Manson's record. That's so bizarre. Man. So what happens next? Nirvana happens next. Smells like teen spirit happens next. All of a sudden, all the bands like Enormous Richard, everybody thinks that there's money in it for them. So Fruit of the Tune was had a quirky business strategy, and they would have made us a quirky success. I'm absolutely sure of this. We'd be almost as famous as Charles Manson or Kinky Friedman. <laughs> but, I'll, I'll go with Kinky. But they went under. Why? Because every band like us in the whole country got signed out, and none of us sold, and everybody got hit with returns, and all the distributors went under, and Fruit of the Tunes distributor went under, and they went out of business. And the guy that signed us, whose name I will not divulge in this podcast, called me and he said, I'm moving to Puerto Rico to run a fish taco stand. <laughs> Uncle Sam will never find me, and you will never find me. Your records are going to be sold in auction, and who knows when, but I can't tell you how I got them, but I'm going to send you some of your records, and you will never tell anyone where you got them in any way. You'll never hear from me again, and you'll never find me. And he disappeared. I got one postcard from him with no return address. He drew a picture of him surfing because he was a surfer. We both had the same missing front tooth, and he had his missing front tooth. And he said, hello from Puerto Rico. <laughs> I got 300 of our records back in the mail, and that was it. That was the end of our record deal. Wow, man. What a story, dude. I'm glad you shared that. That is just... Uh... I can't think of a better thing to go out on. <laughs> love you, brother. <laughs> I love you too, man. Let, love you, rock stars. Let the rock stars know how they can find you, find the bands, poetry scores, get in touch with you, whatever you All want right, them to stars. know. Uh, hey, rock stars. So my email is bro dog at hotmail. Um, shout out at me. Uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, Chris King, S T L C H. R-I-S-K-I-N-G-S-T-L. If you Google poetry scores, you'll get lots of information. We have a legacy blog that's uh, outdated because I'm locked out of the site. Uh, Google bought it when I was in <laughs> dealing with Ferguson here in St. Louis, and I never got back on. I think that's about it. Oh, uh, our bands, Eleanor Roosevelt and Enormous Richard, are on Every Place Music is uh, streamed and downloaded. I'll include links to that, too. And uh, I did that in the Megan's po Megan Gohill post, and I'll, I'll just add that at the bottom of ours, too. And I'm on Facebook. I'm Legis Friend. You can find me there. All right, Groovy. And then um, for Poetry Scores, I know it's a you know artistic collective. You know, Are you always on the lookout for musicians interested in contributing somehow? Musicians, engineers, visual artists, everyone. Uh, we consider our uh, model um, exportable, modular. You could do it in your own town. You don't have to even link with us. Uh, we, frankly, and I'm just going to tell you, we haven't copyrighted any of our ideas. Uh, we're kind of an open source, no money in, no money out. We want people to realize that the greatest words have already been written. Start with them, make great music, make great art, and share it with people. Cool. So rock stars, if there's anybody out there who's just looking for interesting creative people to collaborate with, please feel free to reach out to Chris. Brother, it's not Brother? over, man. We're just getting started, dude. I'm going to see you down here. We're going to be making music before you know it. They're wearing... <laughs> All right, man. I love you, dude. Love you, too. Cheers, man. Talk soon. Peace. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lyd Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.